More than 2,000 coronavirus rumors and conspiracy theories sprang up last year within just months of the pandemic's origin. Um, that was according to one study that I read. Um, we heard everything from the whole thing was a hoax to it was a secret bioweapon to thin down the human race. To, I mean, there were lots of things that were going on, and many of them were contradictory, but they were shared on Facebook and, and Twitter by the same people. So we wanted to look today at what's going on. Holland, that's a loaded question. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Conspiracy theories have been around for a long time. I mean, we had a whole movie about the JFK assassination and the belief that uh, Senator Alf Landon, the first Catholic to run for president on a majority party ticket, uh, would build a secret tunnel between Washington, D.C. and the Vatican, which Honestly, I think that would be a feat of engineering. I'm not sure that should be considered a conspiracy theory. Uh, conspiracy theories are pretty fascinating. And I mean, I've been down some weird rabbit holes online myself. So I wonder about things like what makes a conspiracy theory a conspiracy theory? Um, how did these theories get started? How do we sift through the research to find the truth? And how do we help someone caught up in conspiratorial thinking? Well, to talk about that, Holland, I certainly am not an expert, and I am excited for this conversation. We have two guests joining us. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. From New Orleans, we have Dr. Jeffrey Dancy and Sarah. I'm sorry, Sarah, I did not ask you to pronounce your name first. Please pronounce your last name for me. It's Gugamos. Gugamos. Oh, I love it. It's phonetic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Both of these guests are from Tulane University. We are so glad to have you here at the afterward table. Yeah, thanks for having us here. Both of you have personal stories and something led you into this. So in just 60 seconds each, would you mind sharing the Cliff Notes version of your life and you are? Yeah, so first I want to say thank you for inviting me to the table. My name is Sarah Gugamos. I'm a recent graduate of Tulane University where I studied political science and English. Currently, I work at the Transitional Justice Evidence Tools Project as the research director. In this role, I'm leading a team of undergraduate researchers at Tulane as we work to identify evidence-based trends in issues of transitional justice from 190 countries. I was first introduced to the study of conspiracy theories when I took a course on international law from Professor Dancy last fall. Early in the semester, he mentioned that he was a scholar of conspiracy theories, and I remember telling one of my housemates about it, thinking that it was a bit peculiar to study conspiracy theories academically. But as the presidential election unfolded and groups like QAnon were covered by mainstream media, I decided to join Professor Dancy's project as a research assistant. I feel very passionately about using conspiracy theories as a lens to study different groups of people who, for one reason or another, feel alienated or distrustful of different institutions. And after I conclude my work with TJET this year, I hope to pursue a master's in American studies where I can build further on this work. It's funny that Sarah mentioned I said I was a scholar of conspiracy theories. I hope that it didn't come off like it sounds, uh, which is pretty pretentious. <laughs> I just, I hope that I just said I study them. But uh, I'm a professor of political science at Tulane University. My primary expertise is in all things related to human rights. Uh, so that's the, that's the majority of my work now. Um, but I grew up as a latchkey kid in Louisiana with a lot of TV time. And I used to be very interested in conspiracy theories about JFK. Amy mentioned JFK the movie, which was a big deal for me. Um, and I had seen a lot on the History Channel about JFK before that movie came out. And I was also surrounded by conservative culture, so I got to know it quite well. And I was myself a conservative um, for a long time. I went off to college and then to graduate school where I studied political science with a focus on international relations and human rights. And I'm particularly interested in holding people accountable for atrocities they order or perpetrate in the world. Um, so think war criminals. Uh, my main aim uh, with my work is to reduce cruelty in the world. Uh, so some people think it's strange that a human rights expert also studies conspiracy theories, um, but I used to be interested in conspiracy theories, so that's one reason I study it, but there's also an overlap between human rights and conspiracy theories. For example, H.G. Wells wrote a book in 1940 called New World Order that argued for a bill of rights for humanity 
And that book later inspired the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the early days of the United Nations. Of course, for conspiracists, that association between the Universal Declaration and advocacy for a new world order is evidence that human rights are part of a sinister plot to implement a world government. So a lot of people where I'm from think I'm part of that plot. <laughs> so uh, just by studying human rights, I also kind of backed into needing to study conspiracy theories because I might be a conspiracist, according to a lot of people. <laughs> you know, it's it's so interesting. They say, you know, truth is, is stranger than fiction um, and how one thing leads into another. I was just I'm a huge Calvin and Hobbes fan. And I happened to see that um, the big kablooey is actually becoming a a uh, scientific term instead of saying the big bang theory i'm like this is hilarious that yeah. something in pop culture can now become part of our everyday and incorporated into our life so um well done thank you all for that cliff notes version and sarah you'll have to give us um it's t t tell me your acronym again <laughs> t jet T-Jet. Okay, you'll have to send me that in an email so that I can put that in our show notes so we can link what you're doing there because that sounds absolutely fascinating um, with our show notes today. So, all right. Um, we do love words here at the afterward. Uh, and so because we don't have always an understanding or as you were saying, Jeffrey, sometimes a term gets twisted into, hmm, now, what do we mean by that? Um, let's go ahead and just knock this one out of the park. One of you take this this new term that has now been thrown around in the media, conspiracy theory. What is it? So conspiracy theories can combine different elements of things like rumors, folklore, and urban legends. Um, in a reduced form, there are stories that explain social occurrences by pointing to the causal influence of individual planners or group plotters. So thinking that there's some group of actors who are working against the common good to engineer an outcome that works in their favor. Sarah already said it, but uh, the key element that differentiates conspiracy theories from just rumors, which are stories that we pass to each other, or folklore, which are traditional stories that belong to communities, um, is this element of causality. There's this idea that this diabolical plot by a secret group is... Um, is causing all of the occurrences that we see. It's causal explanations based on individual or group agency rather than big structures or institutions that are operating. It's, it's groups of people that are planning. That's the key. Okay, I can, I can see that. So you both have used um, a couple of words in your definition of conspiracy theory, rumor, was one, what do you, what, you know, we even have songs about that, you know? So these terms are subject to extensive debate, but this is basically how we define them in our research. Uh, rumor, rumors are stories that people tell each other about events or happenings, and they're usually quite short. So if you're thinking about COVID, an example would be, I heard that there were a group of miners in China that all died in late 2019 after shoveling back guano. That would be a rumor. Okay. Short. Possibly, you know, enough enough to tingle the ear to go, oh, I'm going to share that one. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, it's what we might call hearsay. It's just a story. I heard that Bob cheated on Carol with the babysitter. Um, it's rumor. It's gossip. Uh, these kinds of things. Very short stories that lack an overarching theory or narrative. Okay. OK, now I do like this. I do love folklore because I, I love the stories, you know, because there's a tinge of truth in it. Um, you know, uh, before we got started on on this episode, um, Jeffrey and I were talking about yonder and <laughs> somehow that that term. But, you know, folklore has its has its root in a little bit of truth. Like my grandma, who used to tell me to go over yonder and go get something, also used to say, if you eat too much sugar, it'll turn your blood to water. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that because then you have diabetes and your blood is, you know, worthless at that point, kind of, sort of, is where she was going. So what is folklore? Folklore are rumors, stories, or legends that have the added element of tradition for a community of people. So back to the COVID example, 
you could say 20 years from now that uh, an elder in China might sit down and say, let me tell you the legend of the bat miners who shoveled back guano before the pandemic happened. And that would be folklore. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a sense that it belongs to a group of people. You know, different groups have these different stories that are passed down. And sometimes, you know, rumors that start as these little tiny tidbits of stories could elevate to the level of folklore. They become just uh, it, from my neck of the woods. Uh, we were talking about it. I'm from the deep south. There's the legend of Boggy Creek in Arkansas. Have you ever heard of the legend of Boggy Creek? No, because you're not from Texarkana. Uh, but in Texarkana, there's a legend of Boggy Creek, which is like uh, the, a Bigfoot character that lives in Arkansas swamps. And everybody from my area knows about that and it probably okay. started with a rumor that some chickens were disappearing and then people saw somebody that was muddy carrying chickens and then they were like that's the monster of boggy creek and then it became the legend of boggy creek that's folklore gotcha okay and then if you wanted to to have causality and proof then it might become actually conspiracy theory yeah, so I mean, conspiracy theories could take on all types of forms where it'd be like scientists created uh, <laughs> this legend, this this monster of Boggy Creek to steal local livestock and gin up support for the Democrats or something. I, I don't know, but I mean, that's the kind of uh, it, th there would be some plan and there would be some cause uh, of, of that whole story. Okay, this is making a lot of sense. Thank you for helping to. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Urban legend. This became a new term a few years ago. Yeah, so urban legends are a specific variety of folklore shared in and around cities or urban areas, and they often involve happenings that don't make sense in other settings. So again, with the COVID example, we could say, have you heard of the city officials who allowed back guano to seep into the water supply? And that would be an urban legend because it's located around an urban setting. Yeah, and you can think of others that aren't related to COVID. For example, you know, uh, there was an urban legend when I was growing up, and I, I lived in a mid-sized city, 200,000 people, but that if you flashed your lights at somebody at nighttime um, to tell them to turn their lights on, they were riding in the dark, then they would actually turn around and shoot you because it was a gang initiation ritual. And so people got really scared about flashing their lights at other cars, of course, it's an urban legend. It's I, I don't know any instances where that actually happened, uh, but that doesn't really make that, you know, that that kind of uh, perpetuated in an area where there's a lot of gang violence. And, and so it wouldn't really make a lot of sense outside of a city. OK, so let's move to our next and final one. Uh, debunk. How would we debunk that um, <clears throat> issue? So to debunk something is simply to present evidence that disconfirms the expectations of the conspiracy theory. So back with Jeff's example, you could point to data that says that no one in this city has been killed because they flashed their lights at somebody at night. And that would be debunking it. Whether or not people would feel safe enough or they would trust you is another question, but that would be the mm. debunking it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, there have been famous debunkings in the past, so I don't know how deep we want to get into some of the histories of conspiracy theories, but a very important text in the history of conspiracy theories is called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was supposedly some some notes from a meeting of the elders of Zion who were explaining that they wanted to, and the elders of Zion were uh, were Jewish elders, and they were explaining that they wanted to take over the world, right? And then this was the publication of those secret notes, meeting notes. It was proven beyond a reasonable doubt in 1921 to be a forgery, and everybody knows that it's a forgery. It's very clearly debunked, but people still to this day perpetuate the theory that there's the proto that the elders of Zion hatched this Jewish conspiracy and that conspiracy still exists now. Um, and so um, that's that's debunking. It happens, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the conspiracy theory goes away. Interesting. Is that one of the reasons and leads to some of the anti-Semitism? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, 
And and which is interesting because we did a whole episode on anti-Semitism. And so um, even the symbols and things that go along with that was it was interesting. Well, thank you all so much. I definitely am excited for this episode. Holland, I know you are as well. So I'm going to let you start us off with this next question. All right. Well, can you take us through the life cycle of a conspiracy theory? How does it begin? How does it grow? How does it reproduce? This is a tough question, Holland, uh, if I'm being honest. And it's because um, explaining why conspiracy theories spread is like trying to explain why ideas spread as a whole. Um, and, and that's a tough question to answer. But we like to think of conspiracy theories like memes. Uh, a meme is, a, uh, in its original definition from Richard Dawkins, is a cultural unit that humans pass to each other using non-genetic means. Now that's like a pretty scientific sounding definition, but it just means things that we pass to each other, symbols, pictures, videos, uh, pieces of text that have words on them, right? Um, these, uh, these are things that spread, as we know, across the internet and usually with slight variations, right? And so, it's people study the spread of memes and some some think that they follow kind of um, epidemiologists, for example, think that they follow uh, epidemics. They follow epidemic curves, that there's uh, kind of an initial contagion phase and then it really takes off and then it fades away. Um, other people uh, that are kind of doing armchair research say that there's a stealth phase where they're being hatched the conspiracy theories. There's an awareness phase, which is where uh, they start to get spread around on internet forums. There's a mania phase where the public media pick up on the conspiracy theory, and it's all you read about for two weeks, which happened with QAnon. And then there's a moving on phase, which is everybody kind of forgets it and moves to the next meme or a conspiracy theory. So with memes, and I think this extends to conspiracy theories, studies have found that early adopters and how influential they are really makes a difference for how popular the meme becomes. So if uh, somebody like Kim Kardashian tweets it, then it's going to get more play. And then community concentration. So if you have a dense network of people that are all sharing the same information and batting it around, then it's likely to spread more quickly, right? This influences uptake and spread. But this is a really critical piece here. Early popularity for a conspiracy theory or a meme doesn't always predict its longevity, right? So we're all talking about QAnon now, but we'll be talking about it in two or three years. It's almost impossible to predict. So it's, uh, it's hard to know which will flame out and which will last a long time. So um, you can think about conspiracy theories this way. Some spread very quickly, like Pizzagate. If you're not familiar with Pizzagate, it was this, it was the idea that this, uh, this pizza place called Comet Pizza or something um, was a place where Democrats were running a child trafficking sex ring. OK, and uh, in the basement, and it was because John Podesta and Hillary Clinton were sharing emails about pizza. Um, there was somebody that went and tried to expose that basement and he, he was fully armed and he found that there was no basement at, at the pizza shop. And so uh, this kind of faded away very quickly. It was it was uh, it spread. It was debunked. Somebody got in trouble for it. He apologized and said he was wrong, actually, which is really fascinating. And then Pizzagate went away. Then there are others that simmer for a long time and just stay with us. New World Order, the JFK assassination, 9-11 truthers that this was an inside job. These are long simmering conspiracy theories. It is hard to know which are going to be the Pizzagates and which are going to be the JFKs. But we have some guesses, but it's hard to know uh, a priori which is going to be uh, what. I think there needs to be some kind of, of law of communication that if a conversation goes on long enough, someone will mention Kim Kardashian. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did it right at the top, so I didn't even have to that's go. Right, that's right. right. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. So that is interesting about how quickly some, I mean, you mentioned the protocols of the elders of Zion. I mean, I've heard of that and it's been around, what, a hundred years or more? And, 1905. Uh, yeah, it came out. Wow. And, and other things, like you say, we were hearing a lot about just a few weeks ago have completely disappeared. 
That's right. It's uh, so some things are like standards in the conspiracy theory community that they've just been with us for 200, 300 years. Um, and, and so like the Illuminati was a group that existed. It actually existed in Germany in Bavaria for 10 years, T- 1776 to 1786. And people are still talking about the Illuminati. And it's just amazing. And it's because it got written into conspiracy theories that were very influential in book form right after the French Revolution. And then they just stuck. The, I, the Illuminati stuck with us. And that so it's got incredible longevity. But would anybody have predicted that in 1776? No. There were far greater and more powerful secret organizations back then, uh, like the Masons, that were that were actually influential, you know, and had a lot of people. Uh, the Knights Templar were were far more popular, um, and so why did the Illuminati take on this role? It's 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 just wild. It, it became a standard. Well, you kind of lead us into our next question because you know when I think about this, uh, you know, um, you know what are some of the most popular conspiracy theories floating around right now? I mean, part of the um, Illuminati is, it's a great story. You know, it, it's, it's, it tingles your ear. It hits all those buttons and bells and whistles. And, you know, you can have a, an episode of, of, you know, a movie or a Sherlock Holmes or, you know, something and it, and it just tickles, you know, because it, it's got a, it's a, got a great storyline. So what are some of the popular conspiracy theories out there? Right now. It's also just a it's also just a cool word, the Illuminati. Yeah. What a great yeah. word. I if they, if they hadn't come up with it, I hope that I would have come up with it because it just yeah. um, I know, yeah. absolutely. So, some of the most popular conspiracies right now because obviously conspiracy theories are with us across history, so we could, you know, make a whole movie or a documentary series covering all of them. Some of them right now would be QAnon, the stolen election, the pandemic, paid protesters or false flag shootings. But one thing that our research has focused on is what is QAnon? Because we started this work in January. And if you ask a lot of people, they would say QAnon is a conspiracy theory. But that's not really true. QAnon is the umbrella term for a sprawling set of internet conspiracy theories that allege falsely that the world is run by a cabal of Satan worshiping pedophiles who are plotting against Mr. Trump while operating a global child sex trafficking ring. QAnon followers believe that this clique includes top Democrats, including Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and George Soros, as well as a number of entertainers and Hollywood celebrities like Oprah Winfrey, Tom Hanks, Ellen DeGeneres, and religious figures, including Pope Francis and the Dalai Lama. (laughs) Many of them also believe that in addition to molesting children, members of this group kill and eat their victims in order to extract a life-extending chemical from their blood. According to QAnon lore, and this we can go back to folklore, Mr. Trump was recruited by top military generals to run for president in 2016 in order to break up this criminal conspiracy and its control of politics in the media and bring its members to justice. So that's just a very abbreviated deep dive into one part of the QAnon conspiracy theory, as it were. It, it almost sounds unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, when I mean, you, it's, when you it's put like, it all like that, you know, and you, you just like dump the list, it's just yeah. like... <laughs> It doesn't even sound well, like it does, but it doesn't. I mean, uh, what's his name? Jeffrey Epstein really was a very powerful, wealthy man who really did run a pedophile ring. And he really did have some of the very people that you named were his friends. Right. Yeah. And they popped around with him and maybe they were involved with what he was uh, what he was doing. And some of the folks that you've you've mentioned who are powerful people, I mean, it, their secret lives have been exposed. Um, you can think of uh, anyone from Bill Cosby to, um, uh, I mean, there's been, there's been, there's been a host of them. Um, yeah. The over, whole Larry Nasser thing and all that stuff for sure. <clears throat> exactly. And if they aren't involved in it, some of the very folks that you named have been their friends and they've defended them publicly until it was no longer popular to do so. So it, it, it doesn't it sounds unbelievable on the one hand. And yet, on the other, you can see why folks do believe it. Right. Yeah, it's a it's a really good point that there are there is child sex trafficking in the world. Right. And I mean, the state that we live in is known for having a problem with trafficking in general and child trafficking specifically uh, here in Louisiana. And so we don't want to 
come across as saying that this is a problem that doesn't exist. What's interesting about QAnon is it takes facts that we might observe, Epstein's existence in, you know, among the Hollywood glitterati and DC political world, right, for decades or for over a couple of decades and his friendships with everyone, including Donald Trump, right? You would raise that to the level of being the engine behind all of our politics, right? That um, that everything in our politics or on one side boils down to a cover up for this massive child sex trafficking ring. Now, that is where it becomes a bit more implausible, let's say, um, because it's hard to imagine that all of the all of democratic politics, which is what kind of QAnon alleges, is about um, whitewashing or or masquerading this kind of sinister child sex trafficking preference that all Democrats have. <laughs> like that's where it gets a little it scales up too much. Well, thank you. That that really does help. And again, and I I hate to even use the word popular conspiracies because that makes it sound positive and that's not really what we're trying to say it's not like it's popular you know and it doesn't mean that it means what are you hearing in in the buzzfeed that's coming down the pike so i appreciate you all clarifying that because again um we know that um many of these things do and that's kind of where we were why we wanted you to discern and define things like rumor and um, folklore, because there may be some truth to some of these things and why they started. So thank you for helping, uh, helping us understand that. So in one of our first shows back in season one, a couple of years ago, we talked about propaganda and perspective. And a big takeaway for us was that there's often either money or power behind any piece of propaganda that gets a lot of attention. When people start believing and sharing conspiracy theories, who's getting money or who's getting power from that? Is anyone? Sure. It's, uh, I mean, in short, so you're asking the old Latin question, qui bono, who benefits, right? Who benefits from the spread of conspiracy theories? Um, It's just people that are in the marketplace of ideas. It's people that benefit from the sell of ideas, right? Um, and we would include ourselves in that economy, right? We um, write and spread ideas. We're spreading ideas now. And so um, if we were to switch over and kind of embrace fully the kind of conspiracy theory mode of theorizing, um, then we would hope that our theories outpace others. And then maybe we would sell books and then we would make money off of the deal. Right. Um, and so I think that you could think about who benefits as being members of the influencer economy or the ideas economy, uh, but it's also political leaders and coalitions that harness consumer groups from that, um, that, that uh, kind of understand that marketplace and use it to gain political power. Uh, so in short, if you think about it, there's kind of a fusion of the economy of conspiracy with the politics of conspiracy. Um, and so there's a political economy of conspiracy and conspiracy theorizing. Um, and it's just part of, our regular economy. Thank you. <laughs> Follow the money, right, Holland? Follow the money. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're making a lot of money as, as uh, members of the idea spreading community, right? <laughs> oh, we we are, Holland. We, we're going to start our own conspiracy on podcast monetization. Um <laughs> And we'll see how far it goes. Okay. How about but that? Seriously, it's, uh, I mean, it, it is about the information economy. Um, that th- This is all just part of that. And it always has been, you know, in the 18th century, people that benefited from spreading pamphlets d- had pamphlet conspiracy theories. And then people wrote books on conspiracy theories and it's because they're popular and people want to read them. Um, and so yeah. I, I don't think that it should surprise us too much that this is a kind of key element of our world today, especially as the information ecosystem changes and makes diffusion of ideas uh, easier in some ways, but also more competitive because it's hard to get your ideas to the top of the heap 
in what's sure. now, uh, you know, there, in, there are infinite ideas available to us. And so how do we get ours on the top? That's the, right. that's the kind of question. And one thing that you do is revert to sensationalism. That's a strategy for having yourself and the ideas that you spread at the top of the heap. Right. Conspiracy theories themselves as a part of this information economy, you could almost think of it the way that like minimalism took off when Marie Kondo had her Netflix series about if you pare down everything in your life and you only ask if something sparks joy for you, you will be happy and you will feel safe and your life will be better than it is now. And that you know, that was a trend. It was an idea. It gained traction. People thought that was popular. They decided to try this practice and this lifestyle of minimalism. And it's kind of gone, you know, out of the culture again. Some people still are interested in it. Some people still swear that that's the way to structure their lives. Um, But now people are maximalists again, and people have forgotten that that ever happened. And some conspiracy theories are like that. They become this supposed solution to bring some peace and harmony and clarity to your life and the world around you. And whether or not they stick just depends on how they succeed in that ecosystem of ideas. Interesting. Fascinating. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like polyester bell bottoms. I mean, <laughs> yeah. kind of, kind of, you're kind of going, who thought that was a great idea? <laughs> <laughs> and, and are they ever coming back? I, whoa, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> All right. So as we close up part one, what is an essential element we need to know to understand conspiracy theories and um, how they translate in our world. Either one of you go first. So they form, like we've kind of said, they form and disseminate just like other stories and theories do. And as humans, it's normal for us to try to explain events that are happening around us. Some may argue that this is tied to a survival instinct that we have, that we need to understand why events that are maybe, um, uncomfortable or displeasing to us are happening to have some kind of closure, but we are constant theorizers, everybody. Asking why some theories spread is like asking why some ideas spread. It's because they're popular and they make sense to a bunch of people or they provide meaning to people the same way that minimalism might, we could say. That's right. And, and just like we have theories about why ideas spread, I think that there are a couple of different ways of thinking about why conspiracy theories spread. And they're probably, um, they're, they're, they probably overlap and they're not mutually exclusive, but you have uh, the disinformation model and the misinformation model. Okay. So the disinformation model is top down and the misinformation model is bottom up. Uh, in the, in the first top down model, people engaged in strategic communications or propaganda campaigns is what we used to call it. Now we call it strategic communications, right? <laughs> will attempt to plant ideas and sometimes those ideas are conspiratorial in a population of people. So uh, we mentioned the protocols of the elders of Zion. Uh, this was actually a, a fabrication that was perpetuated by uh, all evidence points to it was Russian police that wrote the protocols of the elders of Zion originally. They're, they're called the Okarna. Right. Um, and so it was part of a disinformation campaign. And this is it creates an irony for conspiracy theorists, because often I think the origin of some conspiracy theories that become very popular are disinformation campaigns, which are actual conspiracies. <laughs> and so we study I study we, we both study human rights. Um, we study repression and sometimes repression comes with. Uh, propaganda campaigns against the opposition. And those are planned. Those are planned conspiracies. And we study those things. We know that those exist. Right. And so that doesn't make us crazy, kooky, quacky conspiracy theorists. It just means that we understand that occasionally propaganda is used for ill purposes in the world. And sometimes that means actually spreading conspiracy theories to, to, to confuse a population. Right. Uh, the misinformation model is more bottom up. It's like a rumor becoming ampl amplified in a community until it becomes conventional wisdom. So um, the idea, for example, that the Army Corps, I'm in New Orleans, the idea that the Army Corps of Engineer intentionally breached the levees during Hurricane Katrina started as a kind of rumor. And now there are a significant portion of people that believe that for sure. Right. And it wasn't because there was a disinformation campaign. It was because people in the community shared that idea with each other. And then it ended up finding its way into a Spike Lee movie called When the Levees Break, I think is uh, the name of it. Um, but it's based on folklore 
which has got elements of truth in it, which is that in 1927, New Orleans authorities actually did dynamite the levees and flood the region south of here to save the city of New Orleans. And that's something that sticks with people. Um, and so that's the misinformation model. Sometimes conspiracy theories bubble up from the bottom and sometimes they're planned. Holy cow, my head is spinning. I am, I'm like, I'm, I, 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 you know, when you're talking about the Russian police and the protocols of the elders, I'm like, all I can think about is um, Fiddler on the Roof and the pogroms and, you know, that type of thing. And then when you're talking about Katrina and rumors and how something, something like the, the Tuskegee um, studies that went on creating a truth to not trust medical communities in our African-American populations. I mean, there is some truth to that and having to debunk that information now um, for vaccines has been fascinating. Holland, we need another, we need, we may need a part three and four of this conversation. <laughs> right? It's covering so many of the things that we've liked to talk about, but um, we'd like to say a special thanks to Jeff and Sarah. We have a lot more to talk about regarding conspiracy theories. While you wait for part two, please go to theafterwardpodcast.com and become a subscriber. You can leave us a review uh, wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us. And as always, you're welcome at our table.